welcome. I hope everybody's been having a, uh, a good training program. Uh, as Roy said, uh, I've been with uh, Rogue Wave for a while now. Um, Total View has uh, a long history in debugging. This talk will be a little bit different from others in that I will do absolutely no performance graphs or performance talk. Uh, we're strictly a debugger. We've looked at performance tools in the past, uh, but there are a lot of performance tools out there. So uh, can we recommend you use something like Tau or um, Vampyr or such? Um, suggesting Map would be kind of counterproductive to myself, but uh, since they are our competitor, but yeah, we get along. Um, so let me give you some thoughts on debugging. Um, I've run across a couple of quotes which I thought were very appropriate. Uh, the first one was started by Morris Wilkes, uh, who is a, one of the uh, original computer engineers working on the EDSAC and something. Um, and he found out that debugging was going to be hard. It had to be discovered. Uh, I saw this, the, the last sentence, he can remember the exact instant when he realized that a large part was going to be spent in finding mistakes in his own programs. He said that's when he was running the in-between floors. One of the, you know, you, you build things, you wrote them up on the first floor, then you had to carry them upstairs to the second floor to actually submit them. So, it's, uh, next one uh, is by Brian Kernigan, who's uh, Unix and C and stuff. So debugging is twice as hard as writing code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are, be, you are by a definition, not smart enough to debug it. <laughs> and the last one, which I thought was good, was sometimes it stays, it pays to stay in bed on Monday rather than spend the rest of the week debugging Monday's code. We've all been there. Um, Rogue Wave is a large company which has a number of tools. The particular tool, TotalView, was uh, we were acquired by Rogue Wave back in 2010. Um, so I was part of TotalView at that time. I don't know much about Rogue Wave's other tools, but uh, they're also useful for HPC. We have some static analysis tools and some other things. But uh, I have a slide at the very end which shows the uh, stuff that we do use. Uh, but TotalView itself is basically a source code debugger for C, C++, and Fortran. And like any, any good debugger, uh, it gives you visibility into your application. So you can look at the source code. You can expect uh, all the variables. You can change the uh, control on the fly. Uh, it gives you control over applications. Uh, it's scalable, usability, and support for HPC platforms and languages. Um, TotalView itself, let's see, is that right? Yeah. Um, it's been around for over 30 years or so now. Um, the original uh, TotalView origin was based on the Bolt, Baranac, and Newman, or BBN butterfly machine, which was an early massively parallel computer with all of 32 CPUs in it. Uh, you can get that in some... Uh, desktops today without, you know, can exceed that. Uh, but the butterfly name itself was based on the, uh, the switch, the, the routing switch here. Um, this allowed any CPU to access its own, own memory and access the memory of any other CPU. Of course, the, the latency between, between um, reading memory from another CPU rather than your own was uh, a little bit longer than they would like. But Things have improved a little bit now. Uh, Bolt, Baranac, and Newman um, no longer exist. I think they were bought out by someone not too long ago. Um, but the, the butterfly switch itself had been used um, longer than the butterfly machine. Uh, it was used in uh, IP uh, uh, on the protocol layers, on routers and switches on the internet. So it was part of the original internet. But how do you debug a butterfly? The TotalView project was developed as part of the solution for this environment. They wanted the ability to, to debug multiple processes and threads. Uh, they wanted a point and click interface. So it was always designed as a GUI interface from the very beginning. Uh, and they wanted multiple and mixed language support. 
So you want to be able to debug C, you want to be able to debug Fortran, and you want to be able to debug the parallel stuff. Uh, the core development group has been there from the beginning and has been or are involved in defining MP, MPI interfaces, DWARF, and uh, the open the OM, OMPD, the Open MP Debugging Interface. Um, the original MPI interface was actually, there's no, there's no de facto standard for it. Uh, one of the things that TotalView allows you to do um, when you start running a, a program, a parallel job, you want to be able to control all the processes at once. And the ability to attach to all these processes was something that uh, we developed. Uh, one of one of the uh, original developers is now working with Intel, and somebody somebody from this, I think it was either Argon or uh, um, where, where's Bill Grope Grope from? Is well, he was at Argon. Yeah, okay, so maybe it was all, all in Oregon to begin with. Uh, later we had uh, another, another person develop um, MPI queue, uh, message queue information, the ability to, to grab that information and display it. So some of those people are still there. Um, others have passed away or passed on to other jobs. So after... Um, the, uh, on top of the original interfaces, um, we've added a number of other capabilities. Um, support for most types of MPI, um, lightweight memory debugging. We have type transformations where you can take complicated types, uh, STL containers and stuff, and if you just look at those um, in GDB or such, you may just see that there are a bunch of pointers and things and containers and boxes. Um, with the uh, type transformations, you can just see the data that you want to see. Uh, MemScript and TVScript are two standalone uh, applications, which do not, which you basically start up, you give it some parameters, and it just runs the whole debug job yourself, produces reports, which you can then read. So you can run those in batch jobs. Uh, we have reverse debugging which is a really nice feature. It's only available on Linux x86-64. So unfortunately, it doesn't quite work here at Argon. Um, the Theta machine is a Linux x86-64, um, but we have not conquered um, the AVX 512 instruction set yet. So that, that's still something that's being looked into. I was testing this out the other day got it to a point where it printed a, an illegal instruction, but then I could walk backwards in my code after that. Uh, the, the, the basic idea of reverse debugging is that you go to your point of failure, and then you go back to certain points in the code before it's failure. You can go back and forth and see it work. So it's, it's really, really nice feature. Uh, remote display client is just a tool which um, you can use to uh, debug a remote job, uh, just similar to some of the type of things that were described in DDT. We, not, not quite the same. Um, basically, just starting up a VNC job on the remote site and connecting it back and forth. So you're doing all the debugging locally rather than um, right on your computer or going through X11 things, waiting for all those hops to go back and forth. Uh, we now have GPU debugging, so we debug CUDA, uh, Intel. Xeon Phi, so the uh, KNL machine here at uh, the Theta machine works fine on there. Although I have a little description of some things that you do to get it get it to work, but that's um, we'll talk about that. Uh, most popular pl platforms are supported: Linux, Mac, Solaris, AIX, but we don't we don't do Windows. Uh, we recently have an ARM 64 port. And we've uh, started getting into some Python debugging support. That's currently in progress. Uh, we might get a chance to look a little bit of that. So the key total view features, we have multi-process and multi-threading debugging, interactive memory debugging, reverse debugging, unattended, remote display, CUDA, Xeon Phi. These all work on serial, parallel, accelerated applications. The title of this talk was From Desktop to Supercomputer. Um, I run it on my Mac all the time. I see a couple of Macs around here. Um, so it's available 
uh, if you want to try it out on your Mac. Uh, then it runs, of course, on desktops and up to supercomputers and clusters and such. So, so multi-process and multi-threaded debugging. Um, we support or are supported by most MPI flavors. Uh, by supported by the, the interface that I talked about where we do automatic pro process acquisition was picked up by various things. It never became a real standard, but as um, MPI developers started using things, they uh, incorporated the same tools. We told them how to do it, so it's kind of come a, a, a semi-de facto standard. Um, we do that with uh, starting up a lightweight debug server and an MR net tree configuration. So basically, as you start up your job, we'll launch debug servers, and they will control the various processes. And you can attach to a running MPI job in this way. So you, in this case, you would attach to something like um, AP run on the Cray, or uh, S run on some systems, uh, MPI run on other jobs. Uh, support for open MP and P threads. Uh, we have the ability to hold and control individual threads. Um, you can advance a single thread, or you can hold a particular thread and run, let others run past it. Um, and you can do mixed multi-process and multi-threading programs. It's, it's whatever you can throw at it, basically, basically is comfortable with. Breakpoint control is set on the group process and thread level. There's one question from uh, uh, the Linea talk where you know, we were talking about the ability to set a, a breakpoint on a thread. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, properties that you can do is you can set it on the whole group so that when a, uh, a thread or a process hits the, hits the breakpoint, the whole group will stop. Uh, or you can set it on the process level itself so when the process hits it, the whole group will stop. Or you can set it down on the thread level. And you can set it to either you know, halt the whole group or just halt that particular thread or process. So uh, we give you a lot of fine, fine level control over that type of thing. Total views memory efficiency. One of the things that we uh, like to show is that the, we have a very lightweight backend server. So the um, debug server that gets, gets um, started is not a, another copy of TotalView. It's just a small thing which is used to communicate between the process and the main controlling TotalView. So we, we try not to steal memory from the applications. If you're running on a node, of course, you can have constraints on what the memory is that's on that particular node. You don't want your uh, debug server to be using up a lot of memory while the program is also trying to use that memory. Each server is a multi-processor. One server can debug thousands of processes, or little. There's no con conglomeration of single process debuggers, so we're not just starting up a single process per, per server. Um, there's no artificial limits, so it's no, there's no one, to, one process to one compute node. Uh, you can run a number of processes on the compute nodes. Um, I do this all the time. Sometimes, uh, depending on which type of MPI I'm running, I have to figure out how to tell it, don't just run on this node. I want it to run on other nodes, too. So. Symbols are read, stored, and shared in the front end client. So we uh, do all the, all the figuring out of where things are in the front end. Some of this is getting changed. We are doing a little bit more work on uh, for scalability reasons, that we are pushing the capability of um, querying things um, into the server itself. Um, that's all for scaling. Uh, so just some of the ideas of some of the, uh, the memory sizes here. Uh, the TV client itself, which is the, the part that you're running, is uh, about 4,000 megabytes in virtual size, and resident size is close to 4,000. Uh, the, the MRNet control program is 497, but it's on the, on the remote side, it's, or the resident size, it's only four megabytes. And the TV server itself, 304 and 53. Those numbers have probably changed now. This, is, this slide is a couple of years old, but 
This is the goal. We're trying to keep things very small on the back end. So let's look at memory debugging. Um, memory debugging with total view is achieved through a, what we call the heap interposition agent. So as you start up your program, um, total view will insert the HIA library in between your program and the, and the um, libraries on the system. And then we'll catch malloc and free calls. This is a very simple idea, but there's a lot of things you can do with it. I mean, we, we don't have to recompile the program. Occasionally, we'll, we'll tell you to link against the HIA so that it's always uh, found when you're, when you're doing MPI debugging. But if you were just doing a serial program on your desktop or laptop, I wouldn't even bother with that. Uh, the type of things we can do, we can detect memory leaks before they are a problem. We can explore heap memory usage. Uh, we detect malloc API misuse. So if you're doing a double free, which is actually caught by most Linux systems these days. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll catch that. We'll report what the type of error is. Uh, memory leaks are uh, easy to find. Memory leaks in total view are somewhat different than the fact of just unused memory or memory that's just been allocated and not hanging around, hang, is just still hanging around and doesn't get freed until you, you exit the program. With total view, if you're doing a allocation, you're going to store that, you're going to store the allocation at some pointer or variable, which you're then going to reference in order to you to find that block that you just uh, allocated. Now, if it gets to a point, though, where that, that pointer gets reused, and then suddenly you're, you're looking for that, I, that, that's what we consider a real memory leak, where you can't find that variable that's been allocated. And we store the, all the allocated block pointers inside uh, Memberscape itself. And if there, there's no way for the program to find that memory again, so that it can never be freed, that's what we call a real memory leak. And there's buffer overflows, which are your, your typical, you allocate uh, 1K block and you run 1K, 1K plus one. So we have a couple of different ways of uh, detecting buffer overflows. Um, there's low runtime overhead. Depending on the memory options you use, uh, the, the overhead increases a little bit. Uh, the, the least is a low, which just detects the malloc, malloc issues. Um, then we have a guard block, which is medium type of option of memory detection. And that will add, when you do your call to malloc, we'll add a little bit of information, uh, add a little bit of a block at the, at the front and end of that buffer, and we can tell whether it's been written into. And uh, it works with vendor libraries. Usually no recompilation, there's no recompilation and no instrumentation needed. And although sometimes you may link against the H HIA. Reverse debugging. Um, how do you isolate an intermittent failure? So if you're doing this without total view, you'd set your breakpoint, then you realized you ran past the problem. The, the breakpoint was set too soon. So you go back, you reload, you set the breakpoint open. Earlier, hope it fails. Keep repeating this type of cycle until you find something that breaks, until you find that you're in the right place. Uh, with total view and replay engine, or reverse debugging, uh, you start recording, you set a breakpoint, and maybe the breakpoint isn't there. So it's, you run past it or not, you'll see the failure, but then you can actually step backwards in time. So we have, some of these, let's see, some of these here are up. So this is, as this is go, go forward. This is go backwards. This is previous and unstep. So we have the line of execution is here. If I did a uh, previous, so we go up to the drive class. And all the information that was um, at, at that particular state would be Reinstantiated, so you, you can go backwards in time. I've seen it. 
uh, go to a place where you can actually crash the, crash the program, it'll overwrite the stack, you have no information and you have no stack frame, you do a couple of go-backs and all of a sudden your stack is back. So, you know, that's, that's where things got crashed. There is a bit of overhead for this. I mean, what, it, what it's doing is recording, recording all the information, all the state of the, you know, the program at the, for each step, and uh, it needs to reestablish that state. So it's not something that you can actually change the value or such of the program when you're going backwards in time. It's just like a DVR recording, but you have a lot of control of what you're seeing when there. So it recreates re the context when you're going backwards. You can focus down to a specific problem area. And we have people, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get to the error with replay engine, but as long as you recreate the failure, it's easy enough to go back and find it. Unattended debugging, uh, these are the TV script and M script that I'm talk talking about before. So this is the command line invocation to run total, total view and memory escape unattended. You start up something here. I have a example down. Use it to create an action point. You can give it a uh, subroutine name or a line number of stuff. And then you have actions you want to do. Display back trace, you can show the arguments. You want to do another create action point, you can do it on a line 342 of method C, and then you print X, you give it my, my program, and it has an argument of the data set one. And uh, what TVScript will do is it'll just run the whole program, it'll go through, it'll create out a log file, which will show you all the values that were shown at the action points. Um, and MemScript is similar in that it does memory debugging on processes and displays data. So um, one of the events for memory script is an exit. Exit is always an event. So um, you should always be able to see an event uh, and gather information at that point. And I can see that my um, obviously messed up this M script here. That should be all lowercase and there should be a T at the end. Um, so when it sees an event Action, one of, the, one of them is uh, alloc null. It'll show you the list of allocation. You can check for guard blocks. You turn on guard blocks, of course, uh, give it a runtime. And these are various specifiers that you don't want to show the PC or block addresses and such. Um, so it's a uh, very powerful tool. We have people who, are, who use this in nightly runs to see whether or not they've introduced any memory links into the program. Uh, you can save it. Uh, the MemScript data can be saved in HTML, a memory debug file, and text heap status files. And uh, I haven't used this yet, but I know that they've recently added the ability to do replay in TVScript. And I think what that gets down to is that it dumps out a re replay file, which can again be reloaded back. So you can go through, find these problems, and then go backwards in time the next day. Remote display client is uh, a very simple tool. Um, if you're trying to do X11, pure X11 across a wide area network, it's, it's yeah, you, you have lots of slowdown and lag time. So here we have a Windows, Linux, or a Mac client. Um, I don't show the Mac there, but it's there. Uh, this shows right on your, on your system here. Um, then it sets up a SSH tunnel down to the remote system, and all the, all the information is running basically on the remote system, and we have some smart compression to get it back to us. And uh, actually, ah, that doesn't show there. Let's see if I try and drag this up here. No. Oh, well. I have, I'm basically running a uh, RDC session into... Um, Argon right now, which is the way I've been getting it to Argon. So I use it all the time. Here's the setup 
Uh, this is the uh, actual one I'm using here. So I basically have my remote host, Vesta. I got my username. Uh, I set it up a path to total view here. I can set up arguments for total view, my executable path. This one is basically a run job, so I'm running it on Vesta. I give it the, all the arguments I would normally do, and we have a commit, submit command as a QSub, and this is a, a, um, a little skeleton program, which it runs, or a little skeleton file uh, based on CSH, where it uh, reads in and forms a command which is used to send out through the SSH. And you can see that I first tried this for uh, ATPest uh, 2015. Uh, recently, we've added support for, well, not recently. It seems, uh, actually, it's probably been uh, eight, 10 years now uh, for GPU debugging. Um, we're supports uh, various forms of CUDA, I think. Uh, we're testing uh, 9.0 right now. Uh, the features and capabilities, uh, we've got dynamic parallelism, MPI, base clusters, multi-card configurations, uh, flexible display and navigation on the CUDA device. Up here, if you can see it, um, this is after the kernel has been started up, we have the physical device, so it shows the device the SM, the warp, and the lanes. You can change this to a logical device, which gives you the grid and the block numbers. If you tend to think more of uh, your uh, CUDA threads in that way. Um, device window, uh, CUDA device window, which I don't have up here at the moment, shows what is running where, uh, which I, I tend to bring up a lot when I'm giving demos and such. Just gives you a good idea of which which um, CUDA devices, lanes, and such are actually active and what you can look at. Um, support for CUDA cores, so if you're debugging a CUDA program and it core dumps, we'll be able to load that core file in and tell you where things went wrong. Uh, we do memory checking uh, with the CUDA mem check, which is an option you can specify uh, when you start the program up. And we have support for OpenACC on the Cray as well. So. Uh, uh, it's a nice little feature. Uh, we also do the Intel uh, Xeon Phi processor, coprocessors. Coprocessors, in, in most instances, they look like another node to us. Um, so um, some of this stuff, we support all major Intel. Um, I'm running it on Theta right now. Um, haven't noticed any problems aside from uh, having to set up my environment and specifically. Um, we can run it with or without MPI. Uh, you can use the OMP directives or offload directives, which might be compiled, which might be used with OMP. Uh, the host, and we can also do host and coprocessor at the same time. So multi-device, multi-nodes. Um, AVX2 support is being added, but as I mentioned before, I tried to do Replay Engine, and we're not quite there with Replay Engine just yet. So, uh, MPI debugging, process control, view to cross, shared breakpoints. Uh, so you, you can control individual processes. You can uh, dive into variables, which uh, is not shown here, but uh, basically we want to use, look at a particular variable you can just um, dive onto something like RetVal, and it'll bring up a separate window. Um, we get a little window busy at times, but we're, we're working on that. Uh, and both uh, native and symmetric mode memory debugging is all um, accessible on all these processors. Uh, Knight's landing memory. Um, so the KNL has. Uh, the high bandwidth memory, MCD RAM, uh, which can be used, which is all set up at boot time. So I think, uh, I'm not sure how the, how Theta is set up right now, um, but basically uh, we're, we're using it to track allocation. It doesn't matter whether it's in the standard heap or the on-chip on, on MCD RAM. Uh, optimization may uh, 
uh, should the right, let's see, what does that say? May include, optimization may include making sure. Yeah. So that probably uh, shows how things are uh, set up at boot time. But we can show you your data structure usage. So, so I had this, the last line I was uh, playing around with the last uh, couple of days is let's test this out. So I just tested it out. I didn't see any particular problems with it. So all that memory debugging is good here too. So what next? Um, this, is, this is all the type of things that you expect in a debugger. What, what new is coming on? Uh, we have basically been doing uh, Linux Open Power, a uh, little Indian support on G, with GPUs. Uh, I know some of you are uh, working at uh, Oak Ridge or Lawrence Livermore where the uh, Coral machines are coming in place. Um, the port to, to Little Indian on Linux Power was very straightforward. We do Little Indian on other machines, so it wasn't a real big deal. And we've been working on the uh, CUDA debugging for GPU accelerators there. Uh, we've uh, been using Power 8 nodes with four NVIDIA Pascal cards. And uh, I've been involved in the testing on those machines. Uh, where it's, it's going through acceptance testing and such. And uh, it's been a, uh, a very interesting uh, environment to work in. Um, things are moving along quickly. so. And uh, I've been trying to push any, any bugs they get through fairly quickly, too. We're doing pretty well. Uh, the latest thing, the, the original frames I showed you were the, uh, the old Total View GUI. This is now our uh, new UI framework, with uh, also known as Code Dynamics. Uh, it's a little bit more up to date than what you used to see. It's not quite there yet for HPC. It's, things are coming along. Um, I don't know, I haven't tried CUDA debugging on the uh, on Code Dynamics frameworks here yet, but uh, it does set, um, you can see we have our, uh, we have our um, source window here. Um, this is the view of the process, it's a scalable type of thing. We show the members, which, where you are, and this is configurable, what you see here is configurable, we put in, things like share group, process state, PC, how much you can uh, specify as much as you want to see on here. Um, sometimes it's better to keep it simple. But, uh, and over here is the call stack frame, and then there's the view of the variables that are um, set in this routine at this particular time. Um, there's a couple of frames missing here. There's a very variable you win window which is used which is basically over here. But these, these frames can be dragged and dropped or put various places. Um, so it's a customizable interface. Uh, recently we've been doing some uh, work with Python in trying to add uh, debugging mixed language support. So do we have, uh, do people here use Python much? Anyone? Yeah. So hopefully we, get, we found the right target audience for this. Um, I've been playing around with this uh, in the last couple of months myself. It's gotten off to good things. Basically, um, the idea is that you're, you're using Python to call C or C++ code. Uh, we have a lot of legacy libraries, which are written C, C++, Fortran, and Writing those, rewriting those in Python may not make sense. Uh, runs faster. Uh, but there are many ways to call between the, between the languages. Uh, so we had this uh, Python C, C++ glue technology we called. And there's C types, Cython, Swig, CFFI, PyQt, Boost Python. Uh, I know I certainly deal with a lot of people who are using Boost all the time. So here's the Python code um, without filtering. So we're, right now we're in uh, example.c. So here's the, the, 
here's the program counter. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of stuff here that you really don't care about. There's a uh, high function call, pi val eval framework, um, call function, pi val, pi val, pi val, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is all stuff that's in the, the libraries that uh, is used to glue the Python and the C code together. So when we turn on the stack transformation, we basically just show um, start. We can show in the stack frame we have a module. There's a get fact and wrap fact. So here we see the source code still in the C here. But now our frames have gone down from like 10 to 15 down to just three or four. And we show the uh, C data, C++ data. We also show Python data here. Now, if you want to take a look, you'll see up here we have the uh, tabs for the particular files you're looking at, Python C, Python example, and then there's a test Python to, to C pi. And on the next page, we see um, the Python code itself. Now, we're not, we're not able to set breakpoints in the Python code. I think that's maybe something that they're working on. Um, but you can see the source code. You can see some of these, some of the variables. Uh, I don't think all of those variables are visible just yet. But uh, this is a nice little tool. Uh, another thing we've been working on is debug fission and split dwarf support. Uh, as you may know, when you compile a program, and uh, I would suggest, of course, that you all compile it with dash G. Um, I'd also recommend, at least when you're starting out at the pro at program, uh, when you're starting out coding and debugging, that you stick with an optimization level of zero. Because debugging optimized code is hard. It's easier just to get Everything is correct in a, uh, with, without optimization before you start optimizing things. Um, now debug information can take up a lot of space. We have the compilers where you can do a dash G will produce, most, most of the compilers these days are producing dwarf code, which is what the debugger itself uses to understand how to find symbols, where, where your source files are, which line number you're on and such. And of course, the larger and more complex the code, the larger this actual debug information becomes. So your executable, which may have been fairly small, start growing up megabytes, gigabytes we've seen examples of. Um, with debug fission, which is a uh, new project, um, we, can split the debug we can split the debug information out of the executable itself into a separate file. And in some size, this will reduce the over, overall size of the uh, code itself. Uh, with GDB, we have a GDB index, which allows us to uh, create a simple table of information inside the debugger to find things. And uh, there's DWZ, which is a optimized method of dealing with this debug information. It'll reduce uh, redundancy and such. Uh, so these, these are all supported right now. Using tunnel view. Um, now, I'm probably not going to get to too much of this because I'm just about out of time. But uh, basically, for HPC, there are two ways of doing it, which is the, the classic method. You start up total view. You give it an args of uh, MPI exec. NP512, my program, my arg1, my arg2. So it's just the command line interface way of doing it, which is what we normally do. Uh, some of the things that we run into, um, MPI exec here is uh, executable. We, you may have things like MPI run or uh, AP run, which I found out on Theta, is a script. And we don't debug scripts. We need to get to the executable. Some of these, like uh, MPI run, will have a dash debug or dash TV switch on them, which will also call up the debugger. Um, so it's so start up total view on the, on, the, on the parallel starter. And when you hit go, the job will start up. But you won't see your source code, just because we're actually debugging the MPI process. 
Uh, when you hit go, it'll start up. The processes will go parallel. At that point, we attach the debug, debug servers to the job, and then you can see your breakpoints are set. So you don't see your source code at first. And some MPIs don't support the process acquisition method. Um, most of them do, but sometimes we've run into some that are stripped of symbols and the ones that we need, of course. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fairly scalable. Um, we've run up to hundreds of thousands of processes without a uh, problem. And there's a new, new interface which is using the, uh, this parallel program session here. You tell it uh, what type of uh, MPI job, MPI you're running. Here's Blue Gene Q, or Cobalt. It might be OpenMP, OpenMPI, um, Cray AP run or such. Um, then you give it, you know, tell it how many things you want to do and any um, additional arguments. And this is not quite as scalable. And some of, some of the methods that are used are not quite as scalable because in that case, we do launch a, uh, a debug server for process. But it allows us to get past some of these places where uh, things are uh, been stripped of information. And uh, so here's a new UI for HPC. Um, I say we're not quite ready for HPC just yet, but that's uh, some of the internal stuff. If you start up Total View itself and give it the dash new UI argument, uh, then tell it the MPI exec, it works all. Uh, it just works correctly. Um, and the Python debugging support that I talked about is also only available in the new UI. Um, Using Total View at Argon, uh, modules are available on Theta. I have Vesta and Mirror on there, but that is not true. Um, unless Ray can uh, verify that for me. Because uh, Argon is using the, uh, the soft environment, um, so I had to think. But uh, I, I've run a lot more on Cray than I have on, on Argon's uh, machines. So uh, I'm familiar with modules. I've tried to set up things on Theta right now so that you can do a module load total view, and you'll get pretty much the environment you need. But on uh, the blue jeans, the soft key is total view dash 2017. Total view dash 2017-07-26. It was the day that we started the install. Right. Okay. Well, I had well, I had a couple of different ones available for you. So, um, so they, uh, I've been working on the blue jeans for a while. Uh, things work just fine there. Um, on the cray, uh, I. I Set up here a little bit of uh, showing what you do for memory debugging, how you link against the agent. Uh, the BGQ uh, compilation lines are correct. Um, the static way of doing it is to do this uh, dash WL uh, at path slash TV heat BQS, BGQS LD. Um, and the dynamic. You'll see on uh, basically the dynamic on both is um, you give it the path to the total view library, you tell it you want to live TV heap underscore 64 or on the Cray it's CNL. And uh, then you give it this dash WL to tell it to our path. You want to basically give it to the path so it can find the, find libraries at all times. Uh, you can run Total View on simple serial programs on the login nodes, but uh, that's not usually recommended. Uh, MPI jobs require an allocation, uh, either through an interactive uh, Q sub dash I or through a batch script. Uh, TV script and mem script can be run totally in batch. And I've been playing around, so I have a couple of examples uh, of how you can do this. Um, Working on Theta is a little bit interesting. Uh, I was writing down what you needed to do in order to get to, to Theta. There is a X11 issue in that the 
when you grab an allocation, the X11 information is not uh, forwarded across. So what we've done is to work around is uh, you log into another instance, you, you bring up another terminal, you log into, after you get your allocation, you do an SSY to the theta uh, node that you were given, which in most of the cases has been like theta, theta mom one or theta mom two. And then you, uh, you have an allocation, you have a display variable there, you define the display variable in your alloc the original allocation you have and then things work up okay. Except that AP run on theta is a script so you have to locate the actual executable which I think is uh, slash op slash cray alp 6314 uh, slash bin. Um, Where do you need to use that path? Which one? Where do you need to use the path to the real non wrapped app run? Um, you need that in uh, the total view invocation line. So I would do total view. I mean, ba basically, the way I, I solved it is to set my path so it referenced that um, the Alps version of uh, AP Run, and um, then I just do AP Run directly. So um, scripts are still a problem. And oh, and I noticed that when I did the the. Uh, if I did a module load total view before I did the allocation, I no longer had a module load total view after the allocation, so I had to do it again. But these are, these are niggling little things that um, will um, are easily solvable. Um, that's all I have for this particular thing. Um, you can see me for demos, particular features, or try total view on your code. And my last script is my uh, obligatory company information. Shows you all the other tools you have. And if you have any questions or...